Corridors Part 8 Beachhead The debris crunched beneath Ambassador Evans' feet as he picked his way through the Cresden II colony alongside Colony Steward Itrion. The blue-feathered Onathan gestured to the surroundings with a drooping wing. As you can see, it has been a difficult journey for us. Ambassador Evans nodded in agreement as he surveyed the colony. Dead plant matter, feathered down, dirt, rubble and debris were strewn haphazardly across the streets. Large branches of tree-like plants impaled residential buildings and complexes, spilling glass shards and shrapnel all over the ground. Power distribution spires lay toppled on top of one another, occasionally flashing with sparks emanating from live wires. Evans shook his head. How did this happen? There was an earthquake about a quarter of a journey ago. The earthquake destroyed a lot of the spires and buildings. Steward Etrion pointed to the remains of a tower-like building. That silo housed a large majority of our food stores. The earthquake destabilized its foundations, and a section of its wall collapsed. They turned to face the small lake that bordered the colony. The earthquake caused the water to rise up and wash over most of the lakefront properties, including the food silo. The water washed away a lot of the grain and caused the rest of it to spoil. Steward Itrion flapped his wings in frustration. The Onathan Parliament had sent some resources to aid in our recovery, but frankly, their response has been insufficient. The austerity measures due to the war, coupled with the first prelate's order to expand inward towards the galactic core, have really stretched the sovereignty's resources thin. I can see that. Ambassador Evans agreed. Even though the earthquake had happened four and a half months ago, the colony didn't seem to have recovered at all. He pointed to a large smear on the gravel-strewn lakefront. What was there? Steward Etrion chirped morosely. It was a all. A small group of them lived in the lake. When the earthquake hit, they tried to prevent the water from washing over the colony. Without them, more than half the colony would have been underwater, instead of just the lakefront properties. We haven't seen any of them since, and don't know if any of them survived. I see. Ambassador Evans sighed. Well, it looks like you have a labor shortage problem. I can certainly get some humanitarian workers to help sort out the damage. That would be greatly appreciated, Ambassador Evans. Steward Itrion cheeped. But our main problem is food. That silo was only one of many that dotted the lakefront, and they've all been damaged similarly. Why would you have all the food silos so close to the lake? Ambassador Evans asked. Because we wanted a convenient place to store the setch that we catch from the lake. Also, it made logistical sense at the time, since we could more easily feed the Drykenal when the setch population in the lake was sparse. Steward Etrion replied. The cold season will be upon us soon, and the farms will not be able to yield enough food to feed the colony. What about the neighboring systems? Can't any of those worlds help you with your food shortage problem? Ambassador Evans tried to recall the local star map in his head, and remembered that only the Hildren system was directly connected to the Creesden system. The closest developed farming world is a small moon orbiting a gas giant in the Iridan system, on the other side of the Hildren system. Steward Etrion closed his eyes in exasperation. They also have to support the colonies of three other systems, which dramatically raises the prices of the food that they grow. He gestured to the residential buildings. Our miners have been trying to produce enough ore to trade for the food, but I fear the amount of food that we need will be more than we can afford. So that's why none of this has been cleaned up. Ambassador Evans realized. Everyone's mining in the asteroid belt. Tyler. Ambassador Evans looked back seeing Tara and Kevin following them a short distance away. Kevin was dragging a large anti-gravity cargo lift which carried a 4-meter by 6-meter long aquarium. Tara looked questioningly at Evans. Did you want something, Tara? He asked. Well, I wanted to point out that the tectonic plates in this region are still extremely active. She pointed to one of Derek's old vibration scanners that she was carrying. I'm no seismologist. But this thing suggests a high likelihood that something like this might happen again very soon, perhaps in a year or so. Ambassador Evans turned towards Steward Etrion. 
Maybe it's best to find another location for the settlement. Perhaps. Steward Itrion cocked his head and nodded at Derek's old device. You can predict earthquakes and monitor seismic activity? Such a thing is possible? Tyler Evans. Ambassador Evans turned around again at the mention of his name. Tara shrugged. Well, I don't know how it works, but yeah, the science is well known and established. She didn't even know why Derek built the thing, to begin with, but at least it was useful in this situation. Then she wondered if the Onathans had any experience with seismology, seeing as they were an avian race. If the majority of their civilization's development was airborne, perhaps they never had to think too much about the ground. Something about that thought tugged at her from the back of her mind. Steward Itrion addressed Ambassador Evans. In any case, we would be willing to trade with Earth for food. The miners tell me that the asteroid belt is rich in lanthanides. Perhaps this is of some use to you? Ambassador Evans remembered from Jeremy's musings aboard the old prototype spaceship that Pathfinder probes required lanthanides for production. Yes, that would be acceptable. How much are you willing to trade? We would gladly give you all of our ore if you could supply enough food to help us survive the incoming cold season. Most of the colony citizens do not have the resources to relocate themselves to another world and must stay here and brave the cold weather. Ambassador Evans shifted uncomfortably. Keep half of your ore yield, Steward Itrion, and use it as a security net. Perhaps use the extra cash to purchase building materials and medical supplies for your citizens. Steward Etrion opened his wings briefly in surprise, revealing a multitude of different colors in the underwing plumage. You would be so generous. You know of our desperate situation and that you could ask for so much more. Ambassador Evans shrugged. It doesn't feel right to profit from the suffering of others. Earth will provide food for the coming winter and also help rebuild your colony because it's the right thing to do. The extra ore just helps me convince my government to go ahead with the aid. He turned towards the nightingale with a flabbergasted onathan in tow. Tara smiled. This is why Tyler's our ambassador, she thought. Aid ships would work to stabilize a corridor to the Crazedon system in the same way that trade ships would anyway. A small beep caused her to look down at her spare bioscanner. She put Derek's vibration scanner away. Ambassador Tyler Evans. He turned around again at the insistent voice in his head. At first he thought it was Tara calling his name again, but the voice felt like it came from inside his head. He walked to the lakefront, ignoring Tara as she excitedly ran towards him, waving her bioscanner while gesturing at Kevin to catch up. The calm lake waters suddenly rippled and swelled as the head of a forest green drykenol rose up from the depths. It waved its whiskers in happiness and joy, emotions which were reflected by the humans, who immediately broke into grins. Ambassador Tyler Evans, it is an honor and pleasure to be in your presence. Your name is sung by all the Drakenal of this world in the hopes that you may find us and reunite us with our people. More Drakenal started to congregate and rise to the surface of the water, creating gentle swells that lapped the rocky beach. Tara grinned wider as the beeps from her bioscanner became more numerous and frequent. With each arrival of another Drakenal came a wash of joy and relief. She noticed that tears were streaming down Kevin's eyes. She was surprised to find that her eyes were similarly moist. You are welcome to join us on our ship. We are touring the outer Onathan systems, looking for more of your kind. When our ship is full, we will make our way back to Earth, where you can explore our vast oceans and rekindle your civilization. Ambassador Evans responded. Terra raised an eyebrow and pointed her bioscanner at Tyler Evans. The Drykenal began to churn the surface of the lake in anticipation. We would gladly board your ship. Although the Onathans have treated us with the best of their abilities, this lake and the waters of this world cannot support us for long. We remain a drain on their resources if we stay here. Ambassador Evans nodded. How many Drykenal live here? We number 28. The earthquake had claimed the lives of nine of our community. The Drykenal shifted slightly towards Steward Itrion. Lives that were well spent protecting our friends who have given us so much when they had so little. Terra tapped Evan's shoulder in concern, noting a small bead of blood forming in one of his nostrils. Tyler, are you okay? You're showing signs of a small hemorrhagic stroke again. What? 
I'm fine. I'm just talking to the Drykenal. He answered as the Drykenal recoiled. Our communications are inflicting a negative toll on your neurological organ. We must not strain you anymore, as it is so rare to find one so receptive to our frequencies. Terra looked dubiously between the Drykenal and Evans, and the one-sided conversation that Evans seemed to be having with it as the Drykenal wriggled closer, it waved a whisker at her. Ready. Derek watched the view screen as fifty more trails of light entered the Wynian system, resolving into fifty more Onathan nest chips. The pair of wing-like structures at the back of the nest chips glowed blue as they engaged their sub-light engines and settled into orbit around Wynian II. The Talon in the front of the ships turned towards the distant Greed Star. Hundreds of Talon Shard fighters began streaming out of the nest chips, joining the swarm ships already on patrol in the Winyan system. A slight blip drew his attention towards his weapons console. Shipboard diagnostic complete. Minor damage to exterior armor. Sublight engine safety features offline. Port probe launcher offline. Unknown material attached to port cargo hold. No other damage to report. The unknown material is the port cargo hold, Derek thought, as he rose from his chair to inspect the rest of the ship himself. He approached the sublight engines at the rear of the ship and retrieved his Omni tool from his pocket. It shimmered in his hand as he transformed it into an engine calibrator. I didn't mess the engines up too badly, did I? Alan asked as he entered the central fuselage of Hermes through the port cargo hold. Eh, it's not too bad. Derek said absently as he recalibrated the engines. So Rixeya had a message for you? Was it from General Davis? Well, it was a live transmission that General Davis wanted to give to me personally, and he trusts Rixia enough to let her in on his orders for some reason. Alan squatted down next to Derek. He wants us to help defend Winyan, but to bug out as soon as things go south. Derek noticed that the general seemed to imply that Winyan would be overrun without a shadow of a doubt. He turned to look at Alan's concerned expression. That bad, eh? Alan nodded. Yup. Apparently the long-range scanners in the greed system show that the Forsaken forces could outnumber the Allied fleets by as much as five to one. Derek turned back to the engines. Well, I guess you're going to need these guys running at full capacity. He morphed his Omni-tool into a wrench and used it to tighten the fuel injection port that fed into the engines. Alan stood up and turned around to look at the interior of the Hermes. He gestured towards the panels of electronic screens, some exposed metal tubing, and various electrical circuits that were covered by thin plastic panels. Anything I can do to help? Yeah. Can you go to that screen near the starboard cargo hold and tell me how many Pathfinder probes we have left? Derek pointed to a screen at the door of the cargo hold. It says we have 89 probes left. Alan shrugged. Probably won't be enough. Derek sighed as he finished with the engines and made his way to the starboard cargo hold to inspect the probe reloading mechanism. Probably not. Can you go check the bridge for any damage? I remember there were some sparks the last time we fought Forsaken. Alan nodded and walked onto the bridge. Although a few screens were blown out, the bridge medkit was fully stocked, and the consoles seemed to function normally. An incoming transmission interrupted him. Greetings. Ambassadorial pilot Alan Radisson. Colony keeper Rixia clicked into the translator. Despite War Ambassador Raxon's repeated demands, we will be supporting your ship again in the oncoming battle. Alan smiled. Thanks again, Colony keeper Rixia. Are you allowed to just ignore his demands like that? Colony keeper Rixia waved two of her limbs in mirth. I am a colony keeper. He has no power over me. He can only command the ships and hive seeds that have decided to contribute to a Dominion-wide swarm. Individual hive seeds can choose to act on their own. She settled her limbs and flicked her antennae up with respect. In most cases, a coordinated swarm host under the guidance of a war ambassador is the most efficient use of force. However, in this case, I have decided that supporting your fighter is the best decision. Her third antennae waved dismissively. Raxon may disagree, preferring you to support his fleet instead, but in the end, his opinions matter little as he cannot countermand my decision to join you, nor the orders of your General Davis. Alan sat down at the helm. I'm flattered and honored. Rixia flicked her antennae. 
I also wanted to inform you that I was able to secure a portion of the biomass garnered from salvaging the damaged carrier hives from the Battle of Regit. With this biomass, we have constructed about 45 swarm ships that will be controlled by my subjects and will protect you in the upcoming fight. Alan smiled as his mind immediately began exploring the possibilities of inflicting more damage on the Forsaken ships with support fighters at his side. Excellent! The system-wide scanners alerted them to the arrival of two hive seeds. One of them immediately began broadcasting a short message. Forsaken forces have entered greeds. Invasion imminent. Derek walked onto the bridge and sat down at his console with a worried expression. He began firing pathfinders that would tunnel their way to the neighboring Exto system, their escape route from the coming darkness. General Davis paced his office in the residential module of the forge, impatiently waiting for the meeting to begin. Outside the module, the forge was alight with numerous blinks and flashes as astronauts, ships, and engineers worked on six more Hermes class cargo ships. Aside from those six hangars, the small and medium hangars were empty and unused. Since the majority of the building was concentrated in the central thousand-kilometer-wide hangar, General Davis had ordered the production of humanity's first capital ship as soon as the forge was completed, and he could already make out a faint skeleton of the sleeping giant. It was going to be large, possibly larger than even the Onathan nest ships if the engineer's specifications were to be believed. A blinking light signified that the other members were ready to begin the meeting. General Davis sat down and activated the hollow table and inspected the participants. War Ambassador Raxon clicked his mandibles angrily at colony keeper Rixia, while first prelate Iwardian nodded his beak at General Davis and spoke. Welcome back to the War Nexus, General Xander Davis. We've just received word that the Forsaken have taken the greed system. Thank you, first prelate. General Davis activated a few controls and brought up a real-time map of the Wainan system. I've noticed that we do not have fleets in reserve. Do we have more ships in production? Yes. However, with the loss of the Renteller Star Cluster, Kraedith production will be reduced by half. Prelate Iwardian gestured towards the star map. The resources gathered by the Onathan expansion could potentially make up for the difference. War Ambassador Raxon clicked his mandibles again. We need all the ships that we have in the Wynion system. We cannot allow the Forsaken to establish a beachhead in the Kratith home cluster. With their numbers, they will easily outmaneuver our forces within the cluster and be able to take systems completely uncontested. He pointed an accusing limb at General Davis. How many more vessels do you have? What are you holding back? Surely you don't expect to gain equal access to our military intelligence by contributing only one cargo vessel to the war effort. Colony Keeper Rixia gnashed her mandibles aggressively. If it were not for that cargo vessel that you so cavalierly disregard, you would have been reduced to a writhing pile of biomass in Regit. Colony Keeper Rixia waved her antennae. Do not think that we cannot see through your desire to incorporate the Hermes into your main fleet. Regardless, General Davis began. I suggest we recall some of the ships to form a reserve force to slow down the enemy's incursion into the home cluster after the Battle of Winyon concludes. War Ambassador Raxon screeched. You imply that the battle is lost before it has begun. You, a human who has barely touched the stars, would deign to lecture us on the art of interstellar war. You underestimate the Creedith Swarm Host. We will destroy this forsaken force with our ferocity and tenacity. The only thing that I have underestimated is your confidence in your fighting capabilities and fleet tactics. Raxon bristled his spines at the remark as General Davis continued. You forget that we humans were the ones that warned you of the forsaken plot to strike at Zedran and the home cluster. General Davis gestured to the Wanyan system map and the screen showing the estimated forsaken forces. Your combined Onathan and Kredith fleet that we rescued from Rijik and Yavir in number, less than 35 capital ships. Even with the addition of 210 more capital ships from the Onathan Sovereignty, we still do not have sufficient force to repel over 1,500 forsaken vessels. The weapons platforms and the planetary defenses cannot make up the difference. We must be realistic and focus on bleeding the enemy. And to do that, we need to allow them to enter the home cluster where they will split into manageable sizes that we can destroy. 
First, Prelate Ewardian looked at the projected Forsaken Force. 540 Dreadnoughts, 834 Void Blades, and too many Shadow Spikes to get an accurate reading. Where could they have found the resources to build so many ships, he wondered. Then first, Prelate Ewardian realized that the Forsaken had control of the former Draconil Republic worlds, coupled with the recent acquisition of the shipyards in the Renteller Star Cluster. They would be able to fabricate ships very fast. He shivered at the thought. I agree with General Davis. The enemy may be able to outproduce us, so we must take all measures to minimize our losses in every engagement. That is the reason why they've waited this long before striking at the Kratith Home Cluster. Securing the Renteller Star Cluster was crucial to their future campaigns. War Ambassador Raxon scowled, as Prelate Wardian ordered 100 Onathan nest ships currently on their way to the Wynion system, to travel to the neighboring Extos, Wickney, and Zito systems instead. You are sacrificing created lives to further your influence in interstellar affairs, he accused General Davis. General Davis glowered at Raxon. I'm doing nothing of the sort. I'm trying to put us in a more favorable position in this war. He entered some commands into his tablet and showed footage of the small hangars in the forge. I have ordered the construction of six more Hermes-class cargo ships that will evacuate any systems that the Forsaken besiege in the Kredith home cluster. That should minimize the loss of Kredith lives. An alarm sounded from War Ambassador Raxon's and Colony Keeper Rix's transmissions. The Forsaken have arrived. War Ambassador Raxon disconnected without another word. Colony Keeper Rixia nodded at General Davis. Your subjects have saved the lives of my colony. Know that I will protect them as my own. She cut the transmission. Derek watched the view screen. Fingers poised over his console while Alan secured the communications link to Colony Keeper Rix's hive seed. The hive seed hung overhead, a safe distance from the sun, and wreathed in a cloud of swarm ships. The real time feed from Rix's hive seed showed Derek that War Ambassador Raxon had placed a squadron of about 50 Onathan Predator cruisers behind a lone gas giant probably to ambush the rear of any approaching vanguard forces. Around 60 Onathan nest ships hung in the skies above the Wynion II colony, accompanying eight orbital photon lances. The 43 carrier hives hid themselves in the shadows of Wynion II's closer moon, while 243 swarm ships and 450 talon shards swarmed in the space between the planet and the moons around a set of three Lagrangian point weapons arrays. A trio of hive seeds floated behind the farther moon, their ion cannons trained downwards at the other moon, ready to tear apart any forces that approached from the other side of the closer moon. They were escorted by a squadron of 70 Talonshard fighters and 20 Onathan predators, and supported by two more Lagrangian point weapons arrays. A second squadron of 40 more newly constructed carrier hives hung in the middle between the moons and Wynion II, intended as bait for the Forsaken. A string of beeps quickly dissolved into a continuous drone as 500 dreadnoughts, 830 void blades, and 1743 shadow spike fighters dropped into normal space in the Winyon system, just on the other side of Winyon's soul gas giant. Alan drew in a quick breath. No vanguard force this time. They decided to drop everyone in at the same time. Derek looked at the screen nervously. Those 50 predators, they're not going to last very long. His eyes hardened with resolve. We'll just have to do something about that. Firing probes. Go for it. I'm ready. Alan said as he cracked his knuckles. Shadow spikes escorted the void blades as they crossed into the Onathan Predator's firing threshold. The Forsaken ships immediately spotted them and began firing their maroon lasers while the shadow spikes darted toward the Predators. Torrents of white light fired from the Predators cut swaths through the approaching shadow spike horde and destroyed 35 void blades behind them. They began evasive maneuvers to dodge the void blade fire, but the lasers sliced through 13 predators, sending silver wings spinning wildly into the gas giant's atmosphere. As the shadow spikes closed in on the remaining predators, their purple plasma pulses were suddenly engulfed by 18 brilliant orbs of white light. The Forsaken and the Onathans were temporarily blinded as the white light released fragments of the Wanyan Star into the middle of the Shadow Spike fleet. Sunbursts flared with righteous fury as they consumed hundreds of Shadow Spikes and dozens of Void Blades. 
all caught in place by the gas giant's gravity well. Purple flashes continued to pepper the area as the expanding sunfire tore through the forsaken ships. The Onathan predators reeled from the sunbursts and managed to extricate themselves from the gas giant before racing towards Wynion to second. Shadow spikes and void blades continued to stream past the gas giant, their black ships gleaming in the fading light of the sunbursts. The void blades fired their lasers again sweeping down a straggling Onathan predator. Pillars of light arced backward, catching a few void blades and destroying a dozen shadow spike fighters. They're not going to make it, Derek said as he watched the dreadnought armada start to clear the horizon of the gas giant and fire their deadly red pulses at the retreating Onathan predators. We're not going to make it, yelled Alan as he grunted with exertion. Swirls of flame reached upwards from the yellow Winyan star as it reacted to the Pathfinder's assault on its surface. The ship shuddered violently as a stream of stellar ejecta grazed the side of the Hermes, causing some circuits to explode in the central fuselage. You fired too many probes at once. Sorry. Derek apologized over the blaring alarms. I'm firing more probes now. White light echoed all around the Hermes as he spun wildly while firing probes. The stellar ejecta intersected with the expanding corridors and appeared in the middle of the Shadow Spike fleet, lashing out and destroying dozens of enemy fighters. As they scattered to avoid the sudden inferno, the dreadnoughts fired at the predators again. Their dark red pulses impacted against the shields of the Onathan cruisers and rippled into their hulls. Sixteen more predators exploded, casting their detritus into the pursuing Shadow Spike swarm. The orbital photon lances over Winyan de Sekin acquired their targets and fired. The surge of collimated white light streaked through the system, past the asteroid belt, and carved their way through the Forsaken Armada. As four dreadnoughts exploded, another set of white flashes spewed forth pieces of the Winyan sun, devouring five more dreadnoughts and twenty-three more void blades. Alan pitched the Hermes upwards to avoid another solar flare. The sublight engine screamed as he rolled the cargo ship downwards again, to evade a stream of stellar plasma. How about a change of scenery, Derek? That's a good idea. Let's go save those predators. Derek yelled as he fired more probes in front of the Hermes. As the orbital photon lances began their long recharge cycle, the Forsaken fleet poured over and around the flaring sunbursts and closed in on the retreating predators. Flashes of fire flew in front of them as corridors to the sun stabilized. Hermes exited another corridor in front of the Predators and began firing probes around the retreating Onathan fleet. We're pulling you out! Derek screamed over the comms as the Pathfinders expanded in white brilliance again, encompassing the remaining 19 Predators and relocating them into orbit around the farther Winyon on the second moon, with the rest of the Predators and the trio of Hive Seeds. An angry screech over the bridge speakers startled the humans. What are you doing out of position? Or Ambassador Raxon demanded. You need to get back to the star and destroy more of those forsaken ships. Alan punched the transmit button irritably. You don't give us orders, buddy. We had to save these Onathans because of your tactics. We're going back to the sun now, and don't ever try to dictate our actions again. He cut the comms and nodded at Derek. I'm ready. War Ambassador Raxon scowled at Alan's insolence as he twisted around in his webbing. He screeched at a nearby battle drone. Tell the nest ships to fire now. A stream of white light surged from the upper atmosphere of Wenyan II, reaching out and incinerating 47 dreadnoughts as they approached the moons. Purple light danced across the surface of Wenyan II's closer moon as the Forsaken capital ships melted and exploded. The Forsaken effortlessly replaced those ships with more dreadnoughts and washed over the moon like a black tidal wave crashing over a weathered rock. Their dark red pulses were chased by purple lasers from their escorting void blades chewing through the swarms of fighters near the Lagrangian point weapons arrays. The trio of hive seeds hanging in orbit over the farther moon began firing at the Forsaken fleet. Their torrents of ion bursts crashed into the Forsaken ships, electrifying their black hulls and destroying dozens of void blades. Dreadnoughts from the middle of the massive Forsaken fleet turned to engage the hive seeds and their escorts sending dark red bursts and shadow spike fighters to combat the ambush. The Lagrangian point weapons arrays flashed as they released a salvo of photon lances, 
which traced through the forsaken ships and destroyed seven more dreadnoughts. The orbital photon lances followed suit and beamed white-hot fury into eight more capital ships. The Black Wave simply replaced those ships with more dreadnoughts, which fired upon the weapons arrays. Dark red blasts impacted against the hull of the weapons arrays, sending red electricity arcing through the gun turrets. As several guns exploded, the Forsaken and Onathan fighters engaged each other, firing purple and yellow plasma at any available enemy fighter. The blizzard of fighters and plasma fire around the Lagrangian point weapons arrays decorated the skies of Wynion II, with flickers of yellow and purple as fighters exploded. The Onathan nest ships in orbit opened fire again at the incoming dreadnoughts and void blades this time joined by bursts of plasma emanating from the carrier hives behind the closer moon. As the lead forsaken ships succumbed to the combined Onathan and Credith assault, the ones following returned fire. Void blade lasers lashed out and swept across several Credith carrier hives, destroying 19 in the first volley. Their gutted hulks thrashed in agony as they were dissected and dismembered. The bulk of the dreadnought fleet cleared the horizon of the closer moon, and rained their crimson blasts at the Lagrangian point weapons arrays. The powerful pulses impacted against the weapons arrays, sending shockwaves rippling through the hull. Flashes of bright yellow painted the surrounding fighters as the weapons arrays exploded one by one. Recall the hive seed ambush fleet around the farther moon. We need their support around the planet now. War Ambassador Raxon roared. A nearby battle drone squeaked in fear. The enemy have them cut off. War Ambassador Raxon screeched with shrill fury as he watched the Forsaken fleet flood into the Wynian moon system, isolating the hive seeds and their predator escorts from the planet. He shrieked, Where are the humans? Why haven't they begun firing yet? As if in response, a series of white flashes dotted the Forsaken fleet. Stabilizing corridors spilled forth a maelstrom of starbursts drowning dozens of dreadnoughts and their escorting void blades in flames. Black hulls melted and purple flares flashed as interstellar fuel tanks ignited and weapon systems exploded. The expanding flares passed through numerous reinforcing shadow spikes, leaving behind a wake of violet flickers as the fighters exploded. An additional 85 dreadnoughts broke away from the main fleet as they veered away from the expanding flames. With their escorts, they fired upon the trio of hive seeds at the farther moon. Their crimson plasma collided with the hardened domes of the hive seeds, generating cracks that propagated throughout their shells. Their escorting void blades fired lasers into the weakened domes, slicing open the shields and carving into the hive seeds. The Onathan predators returned the insult, beaming photon lances into the dreadnoughts, managing to destroy eight of them. War Ambassador jabbed a limb at the hollow webbing indicating the fleet of 40 carrier hives that were meant as bait. I want the second carrier hive squadron to blast a path towards the hive seeds. We must consolidate our lines. The 40 carrier hives stationed in the middle of the battleground turned and fired upon the Forsaken that had broken off from the main fleet. Their golden plasma pulses raced through the darkness of space and crashed into the sides of the dreadnoughts, causing power surges in their weapons systems. The Lagrangian point weapons arrays at the farther moon fired ten more lances of white light into the Forsaken fleet, melting through nine void blades and one dreadnought. The Forsaken ships whirled about and answered the assault with a salvo of crimson pulses, furiously blasting apart twenty-one carrier hives and spraying their innards into space. As they turned to fire again at the hive Azids, several flashes of light enwreathed the black ships with vines of dazzling flames. War Ambassador Raxon maneuvered his carrier hive fleet from behind the small moon and into the hurricane of fighters that swarmed around the destroyed trio of weapons arrays. As the orbital photon lances fired another barrage of light past his ships, the hollow webbing detailed the explosion of six more dreadnoughts and three escorting void blades. Fire at this sector, he ordered, gesturing towards the farther moon. We need to consolidate our forces. He watched in confused satisfaction as a quarter of the visible Forsaken fleet suddenly engaged their interstellar engines and headed out of the system. His glee was short-lived as he watched numerous dark ships quickly replace those that left. His thorax dehydrated when he realized that through all the destruction wrought upon the Forsaken fleet, more ships continued to pour in from behind the closer moon.
Every destroyed dreadnought or void blade was effortlessly replaced by two more. The sunbursts cast by Hermes were the only things preventing their fleet from being overwhelmed instantly. Talon shards and swarm ships exploded as shadow spike numbers increased exponentially as dreadnoughts continually crossed into the battleground. A brilliant blue explosion flashed in the distance as a hive seed succumbed to the combined dreadnought and void blade fire. Millions of credith bodies were ejected from the force of the detonation, writhing as they suffocated in the vacuum of space. The remnants of Raxon's carrier hive fleet finally settled into high orbit above Winyan II, and were immediately attacked by hundreds of shadow spike fighters. A nearby carrier hive exploded, its shock waves and debris impacted against Raxon's flagship, showering him with sparks and cries of anguish. The planetary ion cannons streamed rivers of ion bursts upwards and decimated the shadow spike fighters. The Onathan nest ships fired again and destroyed 53 more dreadnoughts with their powerful photon lances. The purple flares were overpowered by another string of white flashes that disgorged several flame tongues of stellar ejecta, which swallowed several dozen void blades. The dreadnought fleet began bombarding the planet their dark red pulses sending deadly shockwaves rippling through the atmosphere as they impacted against the planetary shield. The Onathan nest ship's air shields withstood the shockwaves, but several Credith carrier hives began to disintegrate from the force of the explosions. Humans! A forsaken fleet approaches. Colony keeper Rixia warned over the communications link. What? Where the hell did they come from? Derek shouted as he hastily zoomed out on the tactical map. A large cluster of lights trailed into the system, resolving into a force of 73 dreadnoughts and 121 void blades that began closing in on their position. They must have been those ships that suddenly left the moon. Alan yelled as he swung Hermes sideways to avoid Winyan's wrath. Maybe they stopped out in the void and recalculated their trajectories so they could arrive this close to the star? I don't know, but it's time to go anyways. Derek glanced at the countdown timer on his weapons console. The corridors to Extos will be stabilized in 15 minutes. A stream of blue ion bursts streaked overhead as Colony Keeper Rixia fired Zedron 4's ion cannons at the approaching void blades. The ion bursts collided with the sleek black crescent-shaped ships, causing blue electricity to arc throughout the hull. Purple light flared as eight void blades exploded. The dreadnoughts began to fire their dark red plasma at the hive seed, creating spiderwebs of cracks in the hardened dome. Rixia, retreat to the fallback point and wait for the corridors to Extos to stabilize. Derek yelled as he fired a barrage of Pathfinder probes into the Wanyan sun, showering the dreadnoughts with roiling flames and fiery detonations. As fifteen dreadnoughts exploded, void blades closed in on the Hermes, and swept their lasers through empty space while they tried to hit the small cargo ship. I will not leave you behind. Adjust your trajectory to intercept with my hive seed, and we will retreat together. Colony keeper Rick Sia insisted. Alan spun the Hermes away from the star and headed towards the Zedran IV hive seed. Purple lasers streaked around the ship as Alan weaved Hermes through streams of crimson dreadnought pulses. Derek fired a Pathfinder probe into the middle of the hive seed, and the subsequent corridor engulfed both ships, as well as their escort of 45 swarm ships, depositing them safely under the asteroid belt of the Wynian system. Alan transmitted to War Ambassador Raxon's flagship via Rix's comm link. War Ambassador Raxon, the corridors are stabilizing in 15 minutes. Disengage from the fight and retreat to the fallback point. Raxon's answer came back scratchy and full of static. No, we have not done sufficient damage to the Forsaken Armada. They will overwhelm the home cluster with these numbers. We must stay and destroy as many as possible before we are destroyed. Another hive seed exploded in the background as Alan furiously answered Raxon. We need our ships more than they need theirs. We must retreat now before more of our ships are destroyed. Enough of your insolence. I am the war ambassador. I lead the fleet. Raxon cut the transmission. Ah! Alan yelled in frustration. Derek shook his head as he watched the view screen. As the second carrier hive squadron was wiped out by dreadnought fire, he punched in some commands into his console. We'll have to go and forcibly remove them from the fight. Alan nodded. I hate aliens sometimes. He flexed his hands and stretched his arms to ready himself. 
Colony Keeper Rixia chimed in. My swarm ships will escort you. I will order them to fly close and fire on your targets. A hint of a smile flickered on Alan's face. Thank you, Rixia. He turned to face Derek as the Hermes and the swarm ships entered the corridor to the Winyan II battleground. Some aliens aren't so bad. War Ambassador Raxon flinched as brilliant white flashes spilled in from the view screen. He was disappointed to see that instead of giant expanding bursts of fire, the upper atmosphere was littered with the wreckage of twelve destroyed Onathan nest ships. A nearby group of dreadnoughts turned to fire on his ship when suddenly white flashes peppered their dorsal hulls, carving away spherical sections and scattering them into a swarm of shadow spikes. As the semi-spherical dreadnought pieces plowed through the enemy fighters, forty-five swarm ships fired their yellow plasma bursts into the exposed dreadnought innards, causing massive secondary explosions. Hermes led his attack group through the wreckage of the destroyed dreadnoughts and headed straight for the remaining Onathan nest ships and Credith carrier hives hanging above the planet. Void blades closed in on the swarm ships and started to sweep their lasers through the fighters. Unfortunately for them, Pathfinder probes swallowed the fighters and deposited them behind another dreadnought. The void blades reeled in confusion as dreadnought pieces materialized in the trajectories. Several void blades shattered themselves against the dreadnought's chunks their purple flares mirroring the ones emanating from the unfortunate dreadnought donor as the swarm ships emptied plasma into the exposed inner circuitry. Another flash of light, and the Hermes and its swarm ship escorts appeared in high orbit above Winyan II, protected from shadow spike fighters by the planetary ion cannons. It's time to go, War Ambassador Raxon. Alan repeated again as Derek fired a sequence of probes. What are you doing out of position again? I told you that we are staying. Raxon screeched back in response. You don't understand the situation. The Forsaken have taken the star. We can't go back and throw the Wanyan sun at the Forsaken ships anymore. Derek yelled, exasperated. The corridors to Extos are stabilizing now, and we're sending you there whether you like it or not. Expanding spheres of light flashed all around the remnants of the Onathan and Credith ships delivering them to the asteroid belt where Zidron Forv and colony keeper Rixia waited. Derek searched the viewscreen for more survivors. Below, the planetary dome finally disintegrated from the dreadnought orbital bombardment. Blue flares erupted all over the colony as Aeon cannons exploded from the dreadnought weapons fire. The stream of ion bursts faltered as the orbital photon lances spewed forth another torrent of white-hot beams melting through a dozen dreadnoughts and their escorts. With the planetary ion cannon system in disarray, shadow spike fighters closed in on the orbital photon lances and assaulted them with a barrage of purple plasma. The rolling wave of plasma decimated the hull of the photon lances and interacted with their reactors. Eight brilliant explosions of light blinded both the colony and the Forsaken as the photon lances detonated. Hermes used this as cover to fire another probe this time transporting the ships to the sole remaining hive seed around the farther moon. The cracked dome of the hive seed began to crumble as void blade lasers sliced through, cutting down towers, buildings, and credit civilians alike. The Onathan Predator escorts vainly tried to hold off the assault, but were destroyed by dreadnought weapons fire as the Black Capital ships closed in for the kill. Hermes and its swarm ships appeared in a flash of brilliance and immediately fired a Pathfinder probe into the flailing hive seed. In an instant, the hive seed was engulfed by light and transported to the evacuation point. Derek's mouth dried as he watched the entire Forsaken fleet turn towards their little cargo ship. Hundreds of lasers and thousands of plasma pulses charged across the void between the moons as Derek hurriedly fired another Pathfinder probe around Hermes and its swarm ships. After what felt like the longest second possible, the expanding white light from the stabilizing corridor swallowed them, along with 63 other shadow spikes and deposited them on the other side of Winyan II. Why? Why are we here and not with the evacuation fleet? Alan asked as he twisted Hermes sideways and rolled downwards to avoid shadow spike fire. The escorting swarm ships immediately broke formation and engaged the shadow spikes, trying to keep them off of Hermes. I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't have time to do the calculations to get the probe to exit in the asteroid belt. Derek yelled. There's more to firing probes than mashing buttons like a madman, you know? Sparks flew as the shadow spikes broke through the swarm ships and began firing upon Hermes. 
Alan grimaced as he rolled the cargo ship and turned it towards the planet. Can we go now? Derek fired a couple of Pathfinder probes, creating orbs of light that intersected with a swarm of 23 shadow spikes, sending them careening into the planet. I've got it now. Get the swarm ships to rally around us and we can go. Alan issued recall commands from his console. Hermes shuddered again as purple plasma fire impacted against its armor, as the remaining 24 swarm ships began to approach Hermes again. A small detachment of void blades cleared the horizon of the planet, and swept their purple lasers through the small fighter fleet. The lasers sliced through several swarm ships which fired back at the void blades and the pursuing shadow spikes. A sphere of white light expanded in front of Hermes as a corridor to the evacuation point stabilized. The pursuing shadow spikes fired again, their plasma pulses burning through the armor plating, causing tubing and electronic circuits to burst all along the fuselage of the cargo ship. Another sudden explosion threw Derek off of his chair. He stared at the view screen as he climbed back into his station, which showed him that the swarm ships had safely entered the corridor. He wondered why Hermes was swinging off course. I've lost control of the ship, Alan shouted as the Hermes veered away from the closing corridor. The engines are gone. I'll go fix them, give me a second, Derek said as he grabbed his Omni-Tool. No, you can't. The engines are gone. Alan clarified as Derek stopped in his tracks, staring down the fuselage at a gaping hole at the opposite end of the ship. A security bulkhead had swung down when the ship detected the hull breach, preventing the atmosphere from venting out. Thank you, Council Safety Regulations, Derek thought as he climbed back into his seat. All right. I'm recalculating to take into account our trajectory. One second. He fired a probe ahead of them, creating an orb of light that swept Hermes and a damaged Shadow Spike fighter through to the asteroid belt. Alan watched the view screen as the Hermes coasted towards the remnants of the Allied fleet hanging below the plane of the asteroid belt. Derek glanced at the timestamp and drew in a breath. Alan, I don't think we're going to make it. Alan twisted around in his chair. What do you mean? He asked fearfully. I'm sorry, Derek replied. I must have miscalculated somewhere. The Allied fleet grew larger and larger as the Hermes drifted closer. Suddenly, 34 brilliant spheres of light ignited and expanded throughout the Allied fleet. Moments later, the spheres vanished, leaving Hermes drifting through empty space. Fuck, Alan said as he watched the corridors disappear. The red dots on the tactical map shimmered as the Forsaken fleet started towards the asteroid belt. Ok, I'm firing another probe. I'll take us to a random point in space between the stars. Hopefully, they won't find us while we wait for more corridors to stabilize to Extos. Derek said as he began making the calculations. Are you sure that'll work? Alan asked as he watched the tactical map. Yeah, don't worry. I'm going to take into account our trajectory the maximum range of our probe launcher, and the probe's trajectory and velocity. Everything! He looked up apologetically. Again? I'm sorry. Hey, when you've kicked so much forsaken ass in a few days, you're a lot of mistake or two. Alan replied. Derek smiled as he pressed a few buttons on his console. All right, I'm done. Firing the probe. A thunk sounded from the top of the ship. The two men exchanged glances. That wasn't the sound of the probe firing, Derek clarified. The probes don't make any sounds when they're fired. A piercing shriek echoed from the fuselage as the dorsal hull began to bend. Alan zoomed in on the tactical map. That shadow spike fighter that followed us through has landed on top of us. I thought it was disabled when we went through that corridor. The dorsal hull continued to bend and buckle as Derek fired another probe from the console. The bridge filled with white light as Derek tried to scratch off the Shadow Spike fighter with the edge of an expanding corridor. Damn it, I missed. You're not wrong, though. Its weapons are disabled. He's cutting in. Where are the guns? Alan asked, looking around the bridge. What guns? This is a cargo ship that was intended for evacuation. We didn't include any weapons. Derek replied as he fired another probe. He had to be careful not to scrape off any parts of the Hermes along with Shadow Spike, as the edges of the corridor's superposition fields were sometimes variable and ill-defined. Alan walked over to the central fuselage and picked up a large pipe that had fallen off the wall and brandished it like a baseball bat. He looked up, waiting for the intruder to fall in.
Derek fired another probe. Gotcha! He yelled as an expanding sphere of light cleaved off the top half of Shadow Spike Fighter. The grinding stopped. They sighed in relief. Rapid clicking echoed throughout the ventilation system as the forsaken intruder raced through the ship. With a piercing shriek, it punctured the interior hull of the fuselage and burst onto the deck. It charged on its four hind limbs, each segmented into three regions by two joints. A hardened carapace covered its two large arms that it held extended upwards from the rest of its spiked body, making it about seven feet at full height. The bladed bulbous arms slashed wildly. Alan didn't see a defined head that he could swing his pipe at, since the Forsaken seemed to be made of only arms and legs, attached together by a small middle thorax that jutted out at a 45-degree angle from its legs. Its ebony carapace shimmered with a small bioluminescent hump located in the back of the middle thorax. Alan tried to figure out where the shriek was coming from, but decided to swing his pipe at one of the slashing arms as the Forsaken closed in. With a loud clang, the pipe knocked away the arm as Alan ducked away from the other bladed arm. A prominent spike extended from the middle thorax, which the Forsaken pilot tried to stab Alan with by lunging forward with its hind legs. Alan managed to dodge the spike and dove around the Forsaken to the other end of the fuselage, away from Derek. As he recovered from the shock, Derek noticed that the arm that Alan had hit with his pipe seemed to move sluggishly compared to the other arm. He quickly pulled out Terra's bioscanner and confirmed his suspicions. The electrical readings indicated that there seemed to be a neural cluster of some sort in each arm, in addition to the bioluminescent hump in the middle back of the thorax. It's got three brains! Derek yelled as he grabbed his Omni-tool and ran to help Alan who was swinging his pipe while backing up, keeping the arms at bay. Those bumps on the arms are brains. Barely audible over the shriek of the Forsaken, Alan screamed. Great! How about a little help? He twisted to the side as one of the arms stabbed at him, nearly impaling him against the bulkheads. Alan viciously swung downwards, striking the bulbous section of the arm. A satisfying crunch sounded as the carapace dented inwards from the pipe. Black fluid started leaking out of the dented arm as it fell lifelessly out of the hole it made in the interior hull plating. Alan's satisfaction was short-lived as the other arm slashed sideways, slicing open his left shoulder as he tried to get out of the way. He screamed and fell backward against the fuselage wall, dropping his pipe. The other arm reared up, ready to strike again. A flash of white light caused the monster to flinch as the Hermes entered the corridor and was swept into the void between stars. The forsaken pilot suddenly shrieked in pain and flailed its remaining arm wildly allowing Alan to stagger away from the back of the fuselage and towards the bridge. Derek had cut open the plastic panels in the fuselage, torn out some of the circuitry and wrapped the wires around a metal pipe, and pierced the Forsaken's bioluminescent bulge with the pipe, electrocuting the neural cluster. As it charred and blackened from the electricity, the Forsaken reached back and wrenched the pipe out of its thorax. Tossing it furiously aside, it staggered with surprising speed towards the humans and swung its arm hitting Alan in the ribs and sending him flying onto the bridge. He crashed against the helm and collapsed in a heap. Derek stumbled backward as he tried to avoid the arm. The hump on the Forsaken's remaining arm seemed to glow as it lunged forwards again, slashing feverishly. Derek dove away from the Forsaken pilot and threw a nearby metal panel at its arm. The pilot lunged forward again, brushing aside the metal panel, and struck Derek against the wall of the bridge. Winded, Derek could only watch as the forsaken arm struck again. The bladed arm impaled him against the bulkhead through his abdomen. His gargled screams of pain were drowned out by the forsaken pilot's shrieks of annoyance as it tried to pull out its arm and stab Derek again. Through the haze of agony, Derek saw an opportunity. He sputtered blood, decorating the black arm with his red blood. He stared defiantly at the forsaken pilot. Let me help you with that. Grunting with pain and exertion, Derek grabbed the Forsaken pilot's bladed arm with his left hand and pulled himself closer, passing the arm deeper into his body. His right hand fished out his Omni-tool, which shimmered as he morphed it into a serrated dagger, and stabbed it into the Forsaken's last neural cluster. The atomically edged blade plunged into the carapace of the arm brain with a satisfying squitch. The pilot thrashed wildly, filling the air with shrieks of pain as Derek continued to slice through the neural cluster with the dagger. Slowly. The forsaken pilot slowed in its thrashing as it died. Derek groaned weakly as both he and the dead forsaken pilot sunk to the floor. 
He rolled his head sideways to look at Alan's body. Alan, Alan, wake up. Alan stirred but couldn't seem to move. He watched Derek as he lay on the ground, gasping for breath while bleeding from his shoulder. Derek groggily looked up at his weapons console. He groaned as he reached up and managed to press a button labeled, R. Derek sighed and dropped his arm, his vision fading. Automatic emergency recall sequence initiated. Calculating. Warning. Projected path to Earth will enter void space. Enter manual override. No override detected. Firing probe 1. ETA. 4 days 18 hours. A white light engulfed a broken Hermes, casting them off into the void.